well-known interconnect network that connects different telcos in the world is the SS7 network, and that shall be one focus area of this talk. The other one then is pure 3G security. Aside from these interconnect topics, what can go wrong in 3G um, encryption? Um, SS7 um, is a network that connects pretty much all telcos in the world, some 800. Um, and it's needed to, for standard functionality. Um, it was introduced even before mobile networks existed, but today most of the SS7 function are bound to mobile networks. For instance, SS7 is the network over which SMS are sent. If you send it from one network to another, it traverses SS7. Um, also, if, you, um, if you're roaming abroad and you want to prove to the local network that, in fact, you have a subscription at home and um, the local network can charge to that subscription at home. That information, this information that's needed for roaming, ex is exchanged over the SS7 network. So it is a network separate from the internet, but oftentimes routed over the internet, as everything today is, obviously, uh, through VPNs and so forth, that connects all these mobile telcos. Um, and sometimes they have to exchange security relevant information. So for instance, when you are roaming in another country, as my phone currently is here, I still want to be able to, to use encryption, for instance, right, while I'm conducting a call. But the encryption key that fits my SIM card is stored on a server in Germany. So the Indian telco has a way of requesting that encryption key from Germany. And if there's a global network, and you can request encryption keys over that global network, you can imagine many things can go wrong if the wrong people request the wrong information, right? And that's what we want to focus on um, today. Um, there's, um, th there's, aside from, the, from this global SS7 network that connects all the different telcos to one another, uh, internal SS7 network. So it is not just an interconnect technology for different companies to speak to each other, but it's also for different parts of one company to speak to each other. For instance, different region uh, coordinating on handing over a phone call. So if you're driving out of one circle into another circle, right, this will have different HLRs, they're called, and somehow all these HLRs have to coordinate on, on getting the right subscriber data handed over, right? Um, and this is the second, um, second aspect of SS7 that is very prone um, for, let's say, misconfigurations. That is, there's a global aspect to it and there's an internal aspect to it. And keeping those two separate, like with IP networks, can be challenging, right? The whole discussion of firewalling and so forth. So for instance, this internal uh, SS7 network is needed if a user moves from one location area into another location area while conducting a phone call, right? So you're on the street somewhere, um, and you're using encryption, and you're sending data back and forth with the tower, and you're switching to a tower in a different location area. That location area doesn't know the key, the encryption key. So there are SS7 messages that say, give me the encryption key for a call that's currently happening. Right? And you can already see where, where I'm getting with this, right? If, again, this is being sent by the wrong people and being answered to, we have big security issues. And that shall be the topic for, for this chapter of the talk. Um, let's step back for a second, though, and reflect on uh, what everybody has been known for years. SS7 is terribly insecure. If you Google SS7 and security, only bad things are being said about it. But people usually refer to an aspect of SS7 by which people can be tracked. There's commercial services that offer tracking really anybody in the world. They claim 70% or so of, of phones in the world can be tracked using these techniques. Um, and the Washington Post uh, talked about it intensely last year, exposing a lot of these commercial offerings and the patents attached to them. So this industry seems pretty open about what they're doing. And what they, what, what they do on a technical level is sending a standard SS7 message called the Anytime Interrogation Request, which takes as a parameter a phone number and which gives you back the cell ID, which if you just put that in Google Maps, actually tells you exactly where that cell is, right? Google has a pretty fantastic database of, of all cells that, I guess, Android phones ever connected to, right? Um, so there's this message 
that has no practical purpose, but that gives uh, out the location of a user, right? Um, and by the name of it, anytime interrogation. That sounds like spy stuff to me, right? Um, but to the, to the extent at which this is answered, 70% of the world's users are affected by this, according to, to the, the providers. Um, you can see what a, in what a terrible state the SS7 network is. If there's a message that has no practical implication and that is answered by 70% of the networks to just random people asking for information, right? you understand that nobody does any firewalling at all. right? Well, nobody is wrong too. 30% of the network seem to be doing it. And my expectation is that this number is quickly growing now that people start talking through Washington Post and others about SS7. However, the networks that we have seen fix this issue, they do stop answering this anytime interrogation request. And that is far from enough. If you do investigate SS7 a little more, as we have, if you just read all the standards, you come across a bunch of other messages, some of which do exactly the same, uh, same as anytime interrogation, for instance, this anytime modification. Some others do other functions, but can be strung together as gadgets to fulfill the same purpose. For instance, there's messages um, like the send routing information message that also take a phone number as a parameter. They don't give you the location, but they give you um, the, the SIM cards IMC, right? It's the serial number of the SIM cards, so to speak, and the MSC that the phone is currently connected to. So an MSC is a kind of a governing entity uh, for one location area, or several, um, where subscriber data is cached. And the network doesn't remember you, it's the MSC that remembers the subscribers. So if you know the IMC and the MSC, you can send another message to the MSC, which takes as a parameter the IMC, and you get back this, the location, right? So even if those um, obviously terrible messages are being blocked, and the second one, for instance, isn't often blocked, uh, even if these were blocked, you can string together other messages to fulfill the same purpose. Now, and this is where it gets tricky, because these other messages, they're actually useful. They're not spy message. They are used, for instance, the SRISM message is used to deliver text messages, right? The PSI messages are used to, to find phones when, when they're supposed to receive a call. So you can't just block those, right? And that's where SS7 security becomes really interesting in deciding um, what functionality can you maintain while making it hard to be exploited. Now, that's the SS7 security that people are usually talking about, have been the last couple of years, tracking through SS7. And that is a big, big problem. Um, we wanted to connect, though, to our 2G research, in which we um, captured phone calls and then decoded them. Um, that is not so easy on 3G anymore. In fact, the 3G encryption is pretty fantastic compared to everything else um, that, that predated it. Um, so we wanted to understand what the impact of SS7 is on the encryption quality, right? Um, and so uh, we only looked at tracking briefly and then focused on intercept. I should say that this is not exhaustive um, for, the, for the level of vulnerability in SS7. Aside from intercept, well, I'll be focusing on for the rest of the talk, there's possibilities to uh, cut subscribers off from the network, either selectively uh, for, for incoming or outgoing phone calls. You can prevent them from receiving SMS. Um, you can uh, pretty much kick them out f from the network f until they reboot their phone. All of that is possible if you wanted to do that. Um, more interestingly, probably, uh, because more incentivized, are uh, several fraud techniques in which you can either um, conduct phone calls or send SMS and charge it to somebody else. Right? That's one big, um, big area of fraud. The other area of fraud is remove limitations. So imagine a prepaid card that never stops working, right? No matter how much money you use, right? All of this is easily possible over SS7. And as far as I understand, that's the first area where people actually do start exploiting. Is it, it's clear uh, what, what the incentive here is. And then obviously you can use it for spam, SMS spam. Um, but those three areas, I guess, they're reserved for, for another talk. If you are curious about them, there was a, a talk at 31 p 3 uh, by Tobias Engel, 
uh, he talked about some of these things in a little bit more detail. But let's now dive into the question of intercept. Can you intercept phone calls over SS7? And uh, the answer is not just yes. The answer is yes, using three different techniques, um, all of which are possible on most of the networks that we have tested. So the first one um, is exploiting this, this scenario that I described, where uh, one MSC is allowed to ask another MSC, hey, what is, the, what is the, the encryption key of a phone call that's currently happening? And as I described, this is supposed to only work uh, for, for neighboring MSCs where someone's driving on a road, leaving one area, entering another area, and the phone call shouldn't be disrupted. Right? Uh, however, we notice that we can ask an MSC from the other end of the world. So it's outside of their own network, and it's nowhere physically close to the scenario that you would just warp into another country at the other end of the world and keep being connected to a phone call. That makes no sense at all. Right? We do find, though, that, that a lot of telcos do respond to that. Um, I will show you a demo video uh, at, at the end of this chapter, but let me, let me wrap up the, the other two techniques um, that, are, that can be used to intercept phone calls using SS7. Um, the second technique um, uses IMSI catches, they're, they're usually called, or fake base stations, I guess, is the more technically correct term. And fake base stations have been around for a long time. They're just um, li little, um, sometimes even handheld devices um, that pretend to be a mobile network. And in 2G, that was easily possible because the network couldn't prove its authenticity. Right? So if anybody said, hey, I'm Vodafone or I'm Airtel, the phone had to believe it. Right? You connected to it, and of course, next time you make a phone call or send an SMS, this fake base station receives a copy of it. In 3G, they fixed that. They made it so that the, the, the base station first had to prove to the phone that it's authentic before the phone would, would prove itself to, to, the, um, to the network, and then it would conduct a transaction. Now, this is often broken on the implementation level. So a lot of phones will connect to a 3G base station that, that sends a wrong, um, wrong uh, proof, um, but that's the topic for another talk. Assuming that this works well, assuming that the standard is implemented correctly on the handset, the, the fake base station doesn't work anymore because it can't prove its authenticity unless it just asks for the, the authentication key over SS7. And this is a different scenario now from the one I described earlier. So this is not one MSC asking another MSC for the key uh, for the currently happening transaction, which totally should be blocked. There's no, no reason to allow that, uh, that to happen. This now asks for a new authentication tuple, and that's absolutely needed for roaming. This is exactly when I connect to an Indian network with my German phone. It's like a fake base station, right? The Indian network all of a sudden can prove authenticity to my German phone right, using a key they request internationally. So this is a message much harder to filter and an attack much harder to mitigate. So given SS7, uh, all of a sudden IMSI catches are, are back uh, full steam for 3G, where before people had, had almost given up having that capability again. And then there's um, one more family of, of attacks that, that allow uh, for intercept, 3G, 4G, what have you. Um, and those I find the most interesting ones. Um, we call them rerouting attacks. They work in both directions, but slightly different methods. So a rerouting attack, the idea is to make it so that a call doesn't actually reach the right phone, but instead reaches your phone as the attacker. And once you receive the call, you can always route it back to who should have received it, but you're sitting in the middle. Right? And for incoming calls, that's just using the, the normal voicemail settings on your phone. You can set it so that the phone doesn't ring at all, but that's directly forwarded to another number, right? Everybody can do that on their phone. And what's happening when you do that on your phone is you're sending a, a, a short code, a USSD, you know, these star number hash codes. You're sending that to your network, and that triggers an SS7 message that then fills some, some directory in the HLR saying this user wanted all his calls forwarded to this other number, right? You can send this SS7 message from the outside. Again, no reason that this should be adhered to, but most networks do uh, acknowledge and, and act on it. 
right? So to receive somebody's calls and then route them back to that number, all you have to do is send one SS7 message, right? Um, it also works the way around. You can make it so that all outgoing calls um, that a user uh, makes reach you. Um, and that is using um, a call assist feature it's sometimes referred to. Um, when people are abroad, oftentimes they, they dial the wrong numbers. Like for instance, they want to call somebody in their, in their home country, but they forget to put the area code, the, the, the country code, plus four nine in my case. If I dial from my phone something that starts uh, with, with a zero, I reach Germany, not India, because they make it so that Vodafone, my German network, gets to rewrite every number that I dial. They send an SS7 message saying, whenever this user dials a number, please send this number to this server, and the server will tell you what number they actually wanted to dial. Right? Again, something anybody can send over SS7, and if you flag phones like that, you get to choose where their phone calls go. Right? So all of these are, are, are well-meant features, voicemail, uh, helping people dial the wrong, uh, right numbers, and all of these can easily be abused as long as SS7 messages are uh, uh, um, accepted from untrusted sources, right? Um, so th these are the, the three different ways in which uh, you can intercept phone calls. Um, for instance, 3G phone calls. And the, f the, the first one was um, just intercepting a, a, a call physically and asking for the key, right? And that's the one um, that I wanted to uh, to demo, because I think that's the one we should focus on for the moment in, in, in this public discourse, because it's the one that should not ever have uh, been possible. It's a message uh, crafted just for one purpose, network internal handover of calls that nobody should answer externally. Right? The other two areas, IMSI catcher and this rerouting attack, it's a lot more tricky to decide how do you filter these messages in an international context. How do you decide whether somebody is actually a legitimate roaming partner and your customer is currently in that country and you should answer this request versus somebody just pretending to do that. And you can see how this is more than just a static firewall rule. It will get you into this, a discussion of plausibility checking. Has the user been seen in your own country recently and is it plausible that, that they moved to another country in this time period since you last saw him, right? This type of plausibility check. Um, as far as I know, no network in the world does that yet, right? So big area of, of research and engineering. Um, but let's focus on the first one where, where mitigation is actually trivial. Um, and let me demo to you um, what, what we uh, had shown live actually in Germany, but um, I don't want to drag everything here. So uh, the setup is this. There's a, there's a phone connected over 3G um, to, to a German network. And there's the software radio. There's actually a big antenna sitting next to it. And we want to record a transaction that's sent to this phone and decrypt it right? using a computer that's, that's actually shown in the big picture here. Um, and all we have to begin with is the phone number. Okay? So we have somebody's phone number, and we want to know where they are, and then record their SMS or phone calls and decrypt them. Um, so we start with a with a, with an SS7 query, send routing info, um, that takes as its parameter a, uh, the phone number, right? So we send that over, over SS7, um, and the response includes the, the MSC and the IMC of the, of the um, subscriber, right? So all addresses on the SS7 network, they look like phone numbers. You saw the MSC address. Um, so Using um, the IMSI as a parameter, we send another message to the, to the MSC to get the cell location um, that the subscriber is currently connected to. So this was the second um, SS7 message. And this now discloses somebody's location, which already shouldn't be possible. We, we go to this location and start recording traffic on the, on, on the local cell with that cell ID. And again, we send this PSI message. Because every time we send a PSI message, the, the phone actually receives a ping over the air. And if we record and we send these pings, um, we, we, can, we can guess which phone um, we, we, are, we are targeting. Because the phone isn't known under its IMC um, on the network. It's known under a TIMC. So it's a temporary identity. And so first of all, we, we ran these, these radio scripts here. And, um, and 
uh, looked at wh which different cells there are because in 3G you always record different cells. Um, and luckily on the one cell um, that we were targeting, there's only one MC that in those couple seconds that we recorded received the ping. So now we know the TIMC, okay? Um, and we know obviously where somebody is, what location somebody is connected to. We use that, that TIMC as a parameter into yet another SS7 query, um, send identification, which gives us the encryption key. So this is this query that's supposed to, to do the handover from one MSC to another MSC. So now we have the key, we have the TIMC, and now we just start recording um, the, this, this cell um, and wait for the phone to receive anything. So in parallel, we had sent an SMS here. The phone received an SMS. Um, and um, we, we have that recorded. But decrypting that is a, is a bit tricky. It's a multi-stage process. So uh, again, first, you run this through some GNU radio scripts. Uh, this is all very proof of concept. Uh, I guess you could put this in hardware and have this actually do real time, but we have no interest in that really. Um, and then we look at um, which, which transactions actually happened during those couple seconds that we recorded. Um, and you'd be surprised how much activity there is on 3G. So in, in this case, there, there were five phones receiving something. So I guess we recorded five transactions, but we got to figure out which one is the one we are currently targeting. Um, and Wireshark is of great help here. Wireshark knows all these 3G protocols in and out. I don't know who puts all that effort into Wireshark, but fantastic tool. And so here are the five connection attempts. We again recognize the TIMZ we had seen before, and then we need two parameters out of, out of this connection setup that basically determine the channel within the frequency, like what channel is used for exactly this transaction. So then we decode what we had recorded, uh, given the cell ID, these channel parameters, and the encryption key, obviously. Um, I should note that this is only 64-bit. We'll, we'll be talking about this a little later. Um, yeah, and then um, Wireshark again comes to the help of decoding this. So here's the SMS. Um, yeah, multi-stage process, but you can see how the, the combination of SS7 messages and uh, some, some radio engineer, GNU radio, was a blade RF in this case, gives you all the tools you need to decrypt or decode something that should not be decryptable. Certainly, that this wasn't a cryptographic weakness, right? And this worked in Germany, this worked in most other places we have tried. Um, all right. Um, so that's one way of breaking 3G by just kind of going through the back door of requesting the key that, that protects all of this. There's, um, there's at least two other ways to, to break 3G, uh, more on a fundamental level, and those don't work in most places. Um, but so the, the first one, um, the, the, so the, the first one that I was describing just, just now um, is very, very similar to what we had shown with 2G. So you're, some of you may remember this, this research we did. Um, we, we took this, this fantastic open source project, Osmocom, and we reprogrammed it slightly so that we could just record other people's phone transactions, calls, SMS, whatever, and then we could crack the keys. 2G encryption is terrible. 64-bit keys, but actually much worse than 64-bit than would suggest. Um, you run it through a server, you break this in, in seconds, right? On, on this server, I think we break something like six keys per second on average. Um, and this is just proof of concept, so I bet people can do much better than that. And so very similarly as what, what, we, what we had just shown, only that the phone now got replaced with this Blade RF, right? Still very cheap, 400 euros or something. Um, and the, the, the crypto cracking got replaced with a single SS7 command that actually became easier, right? You don't have to even have the server at home anymore and, and download these terabytes of tables. A single SS, um, SS7 query, right? But so assuming that this were blocked at some point, how else would people approach 3G? So basically, what else can go wrong with 3G security? Well, it turns out that in some countries, um, so suspiciously, all of them in Asia, at least as far as our measurements are concerned, people just didn't switch on 3G encryption to begin with. So there's plenty of networks that don't have 3G encryption switched on. So there's nothing to break. Um, and 
Um, at least two networks in India seem to have no encryption at all, ever. Some other networks seem to have it in some circles and not in others. Um, Korea, interestingly enough, they only have two 3G networks, both of which don't have any encryption switched on. And then random other places, Cambodia. We saw one network in uh, Slovakia, so in Europe, but they switched on encryption last year already, so our measurements were a little older. Um, and you can actually um, check out the, um, the, the current status on this web page, GSM map. Um, now, as, as you can see, we only started recording 3G traffic towards the end of the year. Um, but so it's, it's very interesting. India, in fact, has the most networks of any country we've ever seen. Like, this is insane. This is what, tw 12 different networks? And these are, may not be all of them. Um, and you see how some of these networks do extremely poorly. This would be IDEA all the way on the bottom here and Tata, right? They seem to have no encryption at all on 3G. And then some others, they, they kind of zigzag. Um, it seems like some of the circles have it, some others don't. So whenever you guys upload data, you're changing the score depending on, on where you upload it from. One of those would be Airtel, and the other one would be Vodafone, um, and even ASL seems to have um, s some parts of the country with, without encryption. Um, or, or somebody recorded an IMSI catch or something. Um, so, um, and, and BSNL obviously here. Um, so, a uh, very interesting situation where people um, seem to be allowed to do encryption, right? Some people say, oh, India doesn't allow encryption. Obviously, nobody said that to BSNL, which I think is government owned, or um, who else is on top here? Um, Reliance, right? So those companies do have encryption everywhere. Um, and, but some of their peers just don't have it. Um, so this is something that, that we like the community to, to keep track of. And we built this metric. Um, this is now Germany, for instance. All the networks have 3G encryption enabled. Um, but on 2G, that, there's still st uh, a plenty of room to improve. And the metric we do is simple. We say you get 90% of the score for switching on encryption. And then you get the remaining 10% um, for doing frequent TIMSI changes. So you saw how in my, in my demo, I, I relied on the fact that this TIMZ stayed the same because I, I used it to recognize what data to decrypt. Um, had this German network changed the TIMZ more often, the attack would be much more difficult, right? Um, so um, this, this GSM map has been, has been uh, filled with information for years, as you can see, reaching back all the way to 2011, uh, but using very different tools. We started with these Osmocom tools, La um, two years ago, we released an Android application for some phones that, that allowed you to populate it. Um, and this year, we, we uh, bumped up the, the Android application. I'll talk about this very, very briefly in the last chapter. Let me just add one more method in which 3G can pretty easily be broken, um, at least by the NSA um, three years ago. Um, there's different SIM cards, types of SIM cards in the world. So there's the original SIM card, and there's a U SIM stands for UMTS SIM card. Um, so about year 2000, 2001, they introduced this, this new style of SIM cards. But some networks hold on to the old style. And the old style is only able to produce a 64-bit key. And you saw in the demo, when I queried the key, it was only 64-bit. So even one German network um, has not started giving out these U SIM cards yet. That means everything, every call that they ever uh, encrypt 2G, 3G, or 4G only has a 64-bit key. And that is not enough. That, according to the NSA, uh, was broken for, in, a, in a project costing 4 million pounds a couple years ago, 2011, 2012. Um, and by Moore's law, you, you, can, you can see how quickly this becomes an, an everyday capability to break 64-bit keys, right? So it's time now to phase out these older SIM cards. Um, we are collecting data right now on which networks use what key lengths, and we'll, we'll be publishing that, that uh, pretty soon. Uh, we wanted to get it done for here, at least for India, but we have very little data from India yet. So um, you can make it happen quicker um, by, by helping us with data submissions. And that's actually the, the last chapter that I wanted to talk about. Um, now, we, over the years, we have come across um, many different attack types, right? Today I was describing these SS7 attacks, 
Um, but there's other attacks involving SMS, like silent SMS, for instance. Um, there's, of course, the fake base stations, the IMSI catchers we talked about, 2G and 3G. Um, and generally, there's, there's badly secured networks, don't have encryption, don't authenticate, and all of this. Um, now, we've been complaining about this for many years and always hoping that there's a couple people that may be in a position to actually change that, to switch on encryption, to build better phones, to, to um, use phones more securely. But in the end, very little has changed. In Europe, some networks upgraded their stuff. But in the end, all of us are still complaining and nobody does anything. So we wanted to change the dynamics around that. We wanted to make sure that everybody is in a position to do something about their own mobile security. At the very least, know whether or not they're under attack. Right? And it turns out, luckily, that all of these attacks that we have been bitching about for years can be detected on your handset at least heuristically, right? And so this led us to the idea that we should, that we should get the data somehow on the handset for analysis. And we started reverse engineering the Qualcomm chipsets, debug interfaces. Qualcomm is in most modern phones now. I think they're the only ones who have a proper LTE chipset. So all new phones seem to have Qualcomm, and a lot of old ones too. And we found a way to, um, to, to extract all of this data. Um, the, the raw transactions with the, with the mobile network, 2G, 3G, 4G, um, so that somebody can build an Android app to, to do all these heuristics. And then we did build that Android app, and that's called Snoop Snitch. Um, has about 100,000 users right now. We released that uh, six weeks ago or so. So 100,000 users are currently running this app on their Android phone. It kind of runs in the background most of the time. Um, so to, to check. Are they receiving any suspicious SMS? Are they receiving these pings I was describing? When somebody does the SS7 attacks, you're being pinged with nothing following. Um, is their network using encryption? Is their network uh, authenticating properly? So all of this information is available to you now. And if you so choose, um, you can upload uh, information to our server. Um, and information. Uh, what would include, and I'll only walk you through one example, of course this app is much bigger. Um, information includes, for instance, the behavior of, of the, the base station you're currently connected to. Uh, we were talking about these IMSI catchers, right? Fake base stations, 2G, 3G, fake base stations. Um, they behave very differently from normal base stations. For instance, as the name suggests, they want to know your IMSI, right? They want to catch your IMSI. Um, normal networks never do that, right? If you turn on your phone, then one time you send the IMSI, it will immediately give you a TIMSI, and from there on it will only use the TIMSI. An IMSI catcher, even though the phone has been turned on for a while, will ask for the IMSI, right? Very suspicious. Also, it will try to, to, to keep you connected to it. It will say, my cell is very, very strong. Don't connect to any other cell. Well, really, the network measure measurements suggest that that may not be the case. There may be a better cell for you to connect to. So it's kind of really catching you. Right? So all of this behavior can heuristically been, uh, been detected. Now, not, not a single factor, of course, says, yes, this is an IMSI catcher or this is not an IMSI catcher. But if enough of these factors come together and a, a certain score that we compute reaches a certain threshold, then we issue an alarm. Then your phone actually says, oh, you're probably connected to an IMSI catcher right now. Um, Watch out. And if you so choose, um, you can then cl click on, you know, upload this alert, and we collect them. And then hopefully um, we, can, we can make uh, trends out of this. We can see around this embassy or around this, this, this site of a protest, political or otherwise, uh, there, there, there are more images catch a suspicion. So we can actually start investigating it and calling it out. That's the whole goal of this, this research uh, and this app. Now, aside from that, it also feeds the, um, the uh, these statistics. And as you can see, since we released the app in December, uh, we got a lot more measurement points that we, that we ever dreamed of getting. Some of these networks, we had no idea existed. Um, and so all of you could um, make that difference. In fact, um, if you want to do something about your personal mobile security, other than bitching to your mobile service provider to improve the security, what you need to do is you need to go to GSM map, make sure you're connected to a network that has basic security in place, right? So if currently, let's say, you are on, which is a, a, a terrible one here. Um, 
Uh, how to say, so for instance, this yellow one. I idea seems to, seems to have no 2G encryption, no 3G encryption. If you're bothered by the lack of encryption, this is not a good network for you to be connected to, right? Um, so GSM map can, um, can uh, help you make that choice, both for your home network as well as when you're roaming, right? When you're roaming, you can always choose which network you want to use and pick one that at least has basic security in place. Then install Snoop Snitch, at least if you can. It, it has certain prerequisites, so obviously it needs Android. Um, it does need root requirements. Um, it does not work sometimes with Synergen mod. Uh, we're still figuring out a way to, um, to, to, to make it work with Synergen mod always. Um, but as I said, we have 100,000 users, active users right now, so it seems to be working um, on, on a lot of handsets, right? Perhaps yours as well. And then if you do see any suspicious activity, please share that information so we can, we can start doing trend analysis and start calling people out for doing abuse uh, around political hotspots or maybe uh, commercial hotspots, right? Um, and then, if all of this is not enough for you yet, uh, you do have an app here that's open source that gives you access to all data, 2G, 3G, 4G, raw data, like researchers have always dreamed about, on a very cheap device. The, the cheapest device that I know that supports is the Moto E, um, will, will cost you, um, was in rupees, maybe 50,000 or something? No, wait. 5,000 5, rupees, yeah. Um, so a 5,000 rupees research device with raw access to, uh, to all that information and an open source software that, that you're very much invited to, to extend and do your own analysis in, right? Um, so I, I hope that finally gets us as a community out of the always complain mode and into the do something about it mode, right? At least we're ready to do it and uh, we've been waiting way too long. Um, so I hope um, I could shine some light on, on how the, this mysterious world of SS7 makes us all insecure and how some telcos, including some in India, uh, go much beyond SS7 vulnerabilities and you know, forgetting to even switch on basic encryption. And I hope I, I got caught your interest enough so that at the very least you look into installing this tool, if not extending it. Um, and with that, thank you very much. Are there any questions? No questions? All right. Thank you. Actually, I came late, but uh, I don't know whether you discussed about CDMA. So. Yeah, we, we have not researched CDMA yet because there, there isn't one in Germany, and we don't know how to how to go about it. And it seems like once we are. We are done with our CDMA research. If it ever started, it has died out anyway, right? Like the CDMA networks, they, for the most part, did switch over to 3G, like UMTS. So CDMA is really their legacy technology. Um, and at the very least, 4G is the, the one technology to, uh, to, to rule them all, right? Um, I should perhaps mention that, that I currently work in, in Mumbai um, at a new uh, 4G service provider. Um, 4G only, right? Uh, it's called Geo out of Reliance. Um, and you would imagine that by just introducing 4G as your only technology, you are, you're get rid of all these security problems. Um, encryption and authentication is pretty much mandatory, so you don't get to forget that anymore. There is no SS7, it's replaced by diameter, a completely IP based um, interconnect technology. Um, but you'd be surprised how none of these things that I criticized today were actually changed in the newer standard. You're still completely free to fuck everything up, even around 4G technology. Right? Um, I should also mention that we are hiring in uh, for, for our Mumbai team. So if you want to work with the German team, but in India, uh, come talk to me later. <laughs>